Do we want to wait a few minutes? I think we should go ahead. We have, yeah, we have about 50 people already. And so, inshallah, we'll All go right. ahead. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil Welcome everyone to the Isna Sisna webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. I am Alayla Shatara, the Sisna board president. And as Sisna continues to bring to our schools support and resources, we know the importance of this current topic, legal issues uh, facing the schools in COVID-19 era. And today we have Brother Safa Zarzur, um, who's an attorney and a long, 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 long um, uh, member of our Islamic school, uh, Islamic schools in the United States. Safa Zarzur is a Cisna board member, currently and has been for decades. He is the principal attorney of the law firm Zarzur Law, LLC, and vice president of ISNA. He is also co-founder of the ISNA Education Forum. Previously, he served as principal of one of the largest Islamic schools in the nation for over a decade. He was secretary general of ISNA, served as general counsel and chief operations officer of Zakat Foundation of America, chief executive officer of Ikra International Foundation, and served as an adjunct law professor at Loyola Law School. He was also the founder and chairman of CARE Chicago for over 10 years. Dr. Zarzur has always focused on supporting various Muslim communities throughout the country by strengthening vital community institutions that include families, mosques, schools, and organizations that are involved in civic and social services. We thank you for joining us, Brother Safa, today and um, bringing this vital information to our schools. Thank you for having me, Sister Layla. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged and, and uh, honored to be asked to speak today on this very important topic. Uh, I also am I'm gratified uh, of seeing um, many of you that, that I've, some of you I've not seen in a long while. Uh, people that I've, I've uh, had the pleasure and honor uh, to meet um, as we work on, on the development of Islamic schools and have worked for the last three decades. Um, so today I'm covering, I mean, some, all of you probably know, majority of you know that uh, um, my background is that I, I, my master's is in school administration and education from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And then I have a law degree also and uh, what motivated me, my law degree, I obtained later in life. Uh, I went to law school at the age of 36 after having served as a teacher and then a principal. And then, uh, and, and so the main purpose of me going to law school was really to, to work on school law and, and specifically issues um, facing Islamic schools, uh, which falls under the larger umbrella of, of independent schools, um, non-public schools, if you will, in the United States. Um, and, and in fact, uh, my, uh, the two courses I taught when I was adjunct professor at Loyola Law School, uh, one of them was non-public school law and the other one was Islamic law. Um, and so, um, alhamdulillah, over the years, I've, I've uh, uh, worked on this matter regardless of what else I'm doing, uh, whatever else uh, I'm engaged in, I've, I've continuously focused on, on legal uh, issues related to Islamic schools and, and, and non-public schools in general. Um, so I prepared this, uh, this uh, presentation and, and as all of you know, this is an evolving matter and laws literally are being done and made as we speak. Um, many of you saw how fast the, the, the CARES Act uh, went into effect and, and that uh, um, affects the schools. I'm not touching on it today because it really has to do with funding, has to do with your relationship with, with your uh, public, uh, public school district and what funds can you get from them in variety of programs as well as it relates to the issues of, of uh, payments. And many of the schools already have had to deal and engage even legal counsels in some cases to get the benefits that comes their way um, um, uh, through the CARES Act. Uh, there are other acts that were uh, implemented 
uh, and have been passed both on the federal level, uh, such as, for example, the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act um, and, and um, uh, related uh, laws that, that's trying to, to uh, address the, the evolving uh, uh, matters that are coming up because of the, the pandemic. At the same time, um, um, we have we have many states. We have many states that have acted. Um, if if you if everybody can mute, so so when people get uh, phone calls, it doesn't ring us. Um, uh, also, many states have enacted uh, you know laws and enacted uh, um, you know legislation to deal with the COVID nineteen in variety of areas, including as it, 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 it would affect uh, schools. Um, so I start with a disclaimer. Uh, first of all, school law, as many of you know, uh, uh, is, is a state specific law in majority of its aspects. Some of its aspects are, are federal um, issues related to employment, for example, et cetera. But, but quite a bit of it is, is very state specific. So today I reside in the state of Illinois. I am, I am uh, 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 admitted to the bar in the state of Illinois. Um, I work in Indiana. I'm familiar enough with this law, although I'm not admitted to, uh, to, uh, to practice law in Indiana. But certainly any of you who are outside of Illinois, um, what I say today will be in whenever it has to do with the state, it, it, it's going to be state specific uh, to Illinois. So it's important that you realize that this is not a legal advice. The presentation is not intended to provide you with legal advice. It is not intended to address any specific matter. Even if you submit a question to me and I answer you, I'm answering you as to the concept, the legal concept. I'm answering you in generality, but in, in reality to address you a specific question, um, if it has to do with a specific instance, whether it's relating to, to, to a parent, a teacher, a, a student, um, it, that you need legal advice. You need you need to seek uh, the, the advice of a professional uh, professional who is licensed uh, uh, in your state and and someone that you have a, an attorney a client relationship uh, with. Um, and so I hope that that that's clear to everybody. Um, so basically, um, uh, I'm going to to uh, when you look at at COVID. Uh, a lot of people, when they think of legal issues related to COVID, right away think of something very specific, very special. In reality, you know, as schools, we don't cease to be subject to laws and, and, and legal concepts and legal principles and legal precedent just because we have a pandemic. Uh, so many of you who have taken, uh, you know, professional development in the area of, 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 of the law, of school law, um, have learned many concepts, many principles, many uh, uh, rules that apply. All of them continue to apply. And, and, and so you need to realize that the, the issue is how are they affected or what additional stuff have come about because, because of, of the pandemic. And what I mean by that, when you look at, at um, and I'm speaking generally really from the perspective of school board, school administrators, people who are in charge of Islamic schools, and, and needing to implement uh, and, and comply with the laws when it relates to their, to, to their school. Uh, when, when you think of it in a broad term, um, the legal issues that you are faced with as, as a school uh, can relate to um, your parents um, and students. The part of, of that that has to do with the enrollment, anything related to enrollment, attendance, um, issues of liability, all of that is, is really uh, under, um, uh, the, it really is a contractual relationship that has always been the case. It continues to be the case today. Uh, so it's a contractual relationship. And what governs that contractual relationship is any documents that the school has provided for you to induce you to become uh, a part of the school, to enroll your children in the school, or for the parents to enroll their children in the school, um, um, as well as the, the, the school handbook. All of that represents the, the, the contract and the terms of the contract between you and the school. So that's one area. The other area is that when the student is in the school, any issues related to, to the care of the students, education of the students, uh, 
um, any liabilities that can happen uh, in the school, uh, all of that is governed under tort law. Um, and, and anything related to teachers and their relationship to the school or even administrators and their relationship to the, to the, to the school board and the school, uh, all of that is covered under employment contract and employment law in general. Um, so that continues to be the case. And, and when we look at COVID, what I'm trying to do here is to see how it affects um, uh, the school in, in, in those different areas. And I picked about four areas that I felt perhaps are most deserving of being, of being uh, covered. Uh, so so I, I listed CDC guidelines. Uh, I listed um, Senate Bill 1569, and that's Illinois Senate Bill 1569, and I'll speak to that in a minute. Um, uh, then, then communicating with the school community, planning for extended distance learning, then managing employees, uh, including teachers, obviously tuition refunds, uh, school waivers, um, and, and, and hopefully that would cover, uh, would cover everything. And then we'll open it up, obviously, for question answers after that, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, so um, the first important reminder is that every school is struggling with the, decision, with the decisions that are right, uh, and, and they are the right ones to make. Um, uh, in many instances, because it's a developing situation, you really have to, to kind of assess and make your best judgment um, because you do not have the benefit of a, of a, of a hindsight. Uh, but nevertheless, um, uh, you have to make decisions. You can't just stop and say, because I don't have guidance, because there's no law that covers this, uh, you have to continue. So in those cases, what from a legal perspective does the courts, if God forbid you ever faced having to answer regarding a specific decision that you made as a school, um, what, what governs? And I would say in general, uh, um, what um, the law and what courts and what judges are gonna be looking for is that, did you exercise due diligence in whatever decisions you made? Uh, did you decide, you know, did you do your research? Did you, did you, uh, you know, guard against anything that's foreseeable? Uh, and if you did that, then most likely, if God forbid, there is any legal issue, uh, usually you would be on the safe side. Um, um, and, and in that regard, right now, what would be the safest thing for us to do is to make sure that we are following the guidelines of the agencies that are responsible or are combating uh, uh, this um, uh, pandemic. Um, and obviously the very first one is the CDC, the Central for Disease Control. Um, so basically, if, if God forbid somebody contracts the disease in your school, uh, the, the, you to avoid liability, you need to have shown or you need to show that you basically followed all known guidelines that are out there and you instituted them in policies whether it's the social distancing, whether it's you know, um, um, mandating masks, uh, whatever else, whether, whether screening people, um, and by the way, screening is different than testing, and we'll get to that in a bit. Um, uh, screening people, uh, doing precautions, like the, the, the washing of the hands you know, uh, uh, frequently, the, the sanitation, all of that stuff. Um, and so, so, the best and, and safest thing a school can do is to basically uh, look at the, the CDC guidelines. And, and all of you would know that those are changing. And in fact, only last week after the president criticized the CDC and criticized that their uh, uh, guidelines were too restrictive, in fact, they, they, they made some adjustments in them. Uh, so those are things that are kind of changing. Um, um, very, you know, rapidly, but nevertheless, it, you know, it is our responsibility as schools to look at those guidelines and then basically enact a policy that, that, that says that our school will abide by the CDC guidelines as they stand currently. And then you really, you are advised to have somebody in the school who would be your point person, who would be the owner of making sure that they are keeping up with the CDC guidelines, any changes in them, and that those 
guidelines are translated to actions within um, uh, within the school. Uh, because I mean, let's face it. I mean, we are, and I know there's a huge debate out there about about do we even have face-to-face uh, -face instruction at all? Uh, and I know some people are very gun ho about that, very diehards about that. Uh, the fact of the matter, though. It really, in some ways, it's not in the hand of, of the schools in some cases. And in some cases, it's a matter of economics. I know for a fact there are many uh, Islamic school uh, parents who are saying, if there is no face-to-face -face instruction, then I don't know if I'm bringing my kid, kids back. At least they need to be blended. And obviously, on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who are saying, I'm not going to bring my child to a face to face because that is still hazardous, and without a vaccine, my child I'm putting my child in danger. Um, uh, but the fact of the matter, for example, if you take the state of Indiana, the state of Indiana, for example, said that any schools that receive vouchers, and to my knowledge, all Islamic schools in, in Indiana receive vouchers, must have face to face instruction in the fall. Now they can have blended, they can have you know partial attendance, they have they can have shorter days, they can, but they must have face-to-face. -face. Otherwise, they would not, they would not qualify for, for, for the voucher program. So it's not a luxury for some of the schools to even talk about only one option and that option being, you know, being online. Uh, rather, they have to have uh, a school. So again, if you have face-to-face, -face, then you need to have enacted policies that says we are going to keep uh, uh, up with the guidelines provided with healthcare authorities, the CDC is a good is a good uh, um, 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 you know guidelines to follow and and to enact. But in many places, you may have state guidelines that are coming out. In some places, like let's say Chicago, Chicago Public School and the Mayor of Chicago, they have usually their additional guidelines. Majority of the time, they are in in line with the state. Sometimes they are more restrictive than the state even. And so, so you may, you know, uh, not you may, you need to be aware of your local, uh, your local circumstances and local uh, guidelines that are being put out by your health officials, by your governmental officials that are in charge of uh, addressing this situation. So for example, if you look uh, at the um, uh, guidelines from the CDC, and I'm trying to, Unfortunately, my my um, my cursor is not is not showing, and so it's not it's not uh, allowing me to to click on the view the CDC readiness and planning tool. Uh, but this is a very easily attainable um, um, tool that 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 has a link actually a hot link. And by the way, we will be providing you with with the with the whole presentation afterward and you can view it but but it has not only what i like about the the readiness and planning tool for the cdc not only it incorporates all the guidelines that the cdc have enacted but it gives you literally check boxes about you know whether your school uh, have implemented something or not and, and it gives you even um uh, uh, like um, um even pointers as to in, in some cases to have somebody within the school designated to be an owner of the item that's being that's being implemented. But again, the CDC tools, I think every school uh, uh, should look at them and use them uh, to be able to implement things that show again, from a legal perspective, why are we doing all of this? To show due diligence, to show that we as a school under the circumstances we guarded against any foreseeable possibility. We did everything that the experts and the legal authorities, the, 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 the governmental authorities have said you need to do in order to open your school or in order to have a face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, a school that does not do that, a school that does not enact a policy that says we are going to be complying uh, uh, with the CDC guidelines or whatever you know legal guidelines you know, after you, you do your research, you consult with your legal, you know, counsel, you enact a policy that says, this is what we are doing to ensure that our school is, uh, is as, you know, uh, protected as 
as, as a humanly possible uh, from the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic and the possibility of its spread. Um, a, a school that does not do that and they just go back in the fall without enacting anything can open itself up to a great liability if any of its staff or its students contract the, the, the disease. Uh, because it will fail at the very fundamental question, if God forbid it, it, it is facing a lawsuit, which is, which is, did you do your due diligence? Did you do everything in your power to avoid uh, your students or your, your staff from contracting uh, this uh, disease? Now, in Illinois in particular, and again, I go back to saying, your state may have enacted nothing or may have enacted something different or similar, more restrictive or less restrictive than this. But in Illinois in particular, uh, uh, Senate Bill 1569, which, which passed and was, uh, was signed by the, by the uh, governor, uh, basically, as you can see here, um, uh, it, it did provisions that are specific to combating the COVID-19 pandemic. And the, and the, and the bill uh, allowed for the creation of remote learning days and remote learning plans that will count towards your, you know, whatever 160 or 167 or 170 or whatever number of days your state mandate uh, for you. Um, uh, it allows for a combination of remote and, and in-person learning. Um, um, it suspended the clock hour requirement uh, when the disaster is declared. And this is retroactive, by the way. This is where after giving the, everybody the first two weeks I think they gave either two weeks or, or close to a month in Illinois where, where literally, you know, those days didn't count. Um, you didn't, even some schools didn't have the ability and weren't even expected to provide instruction during that time um, until they told up and were able to, to provide uh, uh, instruction. Uh, they also modified graduation requirements. It allowed for the modification of, for the graduating class of, of 2020. It allowed mandated exams to be complete, completed remotely, didn't mandate an in-person attendance. It extended teacher licensure uh, renewals by one year automatically. Uh, and it allowed for retired teachers to return to the classrooms to substitute uh, for up to 120 days um, if, if that is required uh, because they were afraid of a potential shortage of, of, uh, of teachers. Now, I present this to, to, to first to really urge you and encourage you to, to research whether your own state enacted a, a bill that is, or a legislation that is specific to the COVID-19 as it relates to schools. Uh, and the best place to go is for obviously your department of education in your state, uh, as well as your state board of education. Um, and there, that, I mean, all of them, you go to the website, you open it and the first thing, usually it has a hot link that says COVID-19, you know, related, you know, whatever. They, they will have COVID-19, you click on it and it opens up telling you everything that your state did. Uh, it, it is, it is um, useful. Uh, if your state enacted absolutely nothing uh, for you to read through um, uh, some of the enactments and maybe included as policies within your school. But again, you need a, a, a legal you know, counsel to look at that and, and see because some of it cannot be done without a mandate from the state. Like you cannot shorten your days on your own. Maybe you can have policies that allow for, for your graduation requirements to include modified you know, or, or distant learning, um, you know, issues related to exams, all of that being online. You can enact that as a policy regardless of what your state did. But at least in Illinois, you are now covered as a school uh, uh, by the state saying it is okay for you to do that. That 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 should not affect then anything related to your to your uh, accreditation, to your state recognition, to your entitlement to various uh, uh, aids that you get from the state um, uh, or even from from the federal government. It gives you cover for all of that. Um, um, now. The most important thing um, um, that, that I believe a school need to do is really engage its community and, and uh, uh, communicate as much as possible with its school community, explaining to them what is it that we are doing 
uh, as far as things that are being implemented, um, what, what are the expectations of the school, um, and, and, and make sure that, 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 that the community is um, uh, aware. And, and the reason for that, again, from a legal perspective, is the issue of, of due diligence. Uh, and transparency would be very important, showing that the school basically had nothing to hide, had nothing to, didn't shove anything under the rug, that, that, that the school have dealt in good faith with whatever that happened. And that's specifically, by the way, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, God forbid, if, if there is in the school a case that, that is uh, uh, reported, um, you know, being able to communicate with the parents, having having process in place on how you are going to immediately deal with the person who is who has contracted it, um, a process by which you you ascertain the exposure uh, of the people around them, uh, and and what actual actions to be taken regarding the the people who were exposed uh, to the person who who got infected. Uh, again, you need to to develop um, um, you need to develop. Uh, policies, um, and there are many sample policies out there that are coming up on regular basis uh, now. But again, they, are, they, they differ widely. They are, they are, they are changing depending on, on, on the developments. Um, but that is something that, that, that I would say every school need to be um, um, investing in, uh, developing a communication strategy with its, with its uh, parents, again, all of it goes to to show the due diligence um, um, in, in in this case, um, um, and again the four things that that I that that I kind of singled out in in your communication when you develop your communication is that is that you want to make sure that your communication uh, is is uh, um, it is is causing uh, a change of behavior. That is pro, you know, that, that is helpful to making sure that if you have a case that it doesn't, it, whatever made it happen is taking care of that, that, that it, is, it is addressing it basically and, and changing behavior um, as to minimize it happening in the, in the future. Uh, and again, the, where, where was there additional exposure, how you dealt with it? Uh, what are the precautions? What changes are you going to do uh, to to, uh, to ensure that whatever situation happened uh, is going to be addressed? Um, and, and and again, make your standards very clear uh, to your to your school community, both internally, meaning your staff, as well as externally, meaning your 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 parents. Um, again, the, the distant learning. Many of us. Uh, you know, had to 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 do it, uh, you know, on the fly. The last two months, now many schools are preparing uh, for for the uh, for the fall. Um, it is important again that that we uh, make sure that um, you know um, we are complying with whatever our state minimum requirements. And, and in that regard, I, I, you know. Um, even our states, by the way, they themselves have to apply. And when you when we get to the waivers, they have to apply to the federal uh, government uh, related to some of the waiving of some of the requirements as far as standardized testing, uh, reducing of school hours or, or school days, and all of it related, by the way, to, to the eligibility uh, for, for federal funding of, of, of education. And frankly, public schools are far more affected in this regard than uh, 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 private schools, but private schools as well are affected, particularly um, on, on school days uh, and, and uh, school minutes, uh, the number of minutes, uh, contact minutes that are required um, in, in the school. Um, I'm going to read straight here from, from the slide where it says, schools should not assume that any period of distant learning would count toward minimum instructional time requirements and should consider the following, whether the distant learning may count for a course credit, whether participation is required, and if so, procedures of tracking attendance and student participation, um, how to ensure that all students have access to technology, um, and that's very, very important that, that you, you have an affirmative 
obligation if you use uh, distant learning um, that you ensure that every student of your school uh, have access to technology and if they cannot afford it or they don't have it you either provide it to them or you, you provide them alternative to ensure that they are able to do the, 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 the distant learning. In the last two months of the last school year, um, the, the state was very, um, um, very, you know, easygoing, if you will. And, and, and as long as the school did its effort, they took it. In fact, I heard stories of some schools where literally staff members were, were taking packets, knocking on students' doors, handing them packets, and then picking them up from them. Um, there, there were like a lot of leeways that were given, but now that this is going to be with us longer, uh, schools need to make sure that they implement, uh, if they are implementing uh, um, long distance learning, that, that, that their technology um, um, is provided to the students. By the way, including, and some public schools, in fact, they, they purchased hotspots and made even internet available to some of their students that were not able to afford um, again, I don't know how much that, that would be uh, um, applicable in, in, in the case of, um, you know, private schools as far as buying the internet access, but I would say it is something that, that will need to be considered. And my own advice would be is that to work with, 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 with the parents of those students, if they truly, especially I'm talking about schools that, have, that take um, uh, voucher, <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Apologize, sorry. Especially schools that take vouchers um, and enroll students, um, in, you know, through state paid tuition, uh, they, they would have the responsibility probably to go as far as even providing them with uh, internet coverage, for example, if they don't have it at home not as much for schools that don't don't have voucher programs uh, in them but my advice you know as islamic schools is that we make sure that that all of our um, students are able to participate in distant learning if we implement it and and that in fact i feel that ethically and islamically we have even a higher burden to make sure that those students are are provided with with not only the technology but also the access to be able to fully participate in um, in, in any distant learning. And I can tell you, at least from the schools I'm involved in, whether, you know, Universal School in, in, uh, in Chicago or, or um, MTI uh, School of Knowledge in, in Indianapolis, I, I can tell you stories about uh, teachers going out of their way and, and, and way above and beyond, and schools going way above and beyond, uh, making sure that their students have access to, to technology and internet and, and um, uh, are able to, to fulfill whatever the school expects of them in terms of uh, uh, distant learning. Um, now related um, uh, to, to that, and I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, now we move to employees, and I just, let me just take a look at this for a second, yes. So, so basically that's as far as you know, uh, uh, showing due diligence as far as both in-person learning and making sure that you, in, you implement the, the, the policies required and needed to show that you have done your due diligence in keeping a clean uh, environment and, and clean uh, and proper interactions for your students, as well as if you go, if you do hybrid or you go online, that you have, you have gone, you know, the extra mile in providing your students with, with the access, with the technology required, with, with, with the guidelines that enables them to, um, uh, to, to, carry, to carry on instruction. So now I wanna move to another area that, that is um, related more to teachers. And as I mentioned, um, teachers and staff in general, actually, even administrators, anybody employed by the Islamic school um, it, it is basically under, you know, covered under variety of, of labor laws and, and, and other federal and state laws uh, related to that. The one issue that I singled out, and again, maybe in question answers, you will have more 
uh, more questions to ask, but the one that, that stood out for me is this um, 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 idea of, of um, uh, employees, if they, if they contract, uh, God forbid, the, the, the disease, um, as well as um, if the school is to close or quarantine a certain staff member or many staff members or, or, or things of that nature, what happens as far as their pay? What happens as far as you know, uh, other, other things related to, to uh, their compensation? Um, um, and so basically, um, um, first of all, as far as being able to, to go on sick leave, obviously we know that normally you have your, your sick leave as a school, whatever many days that you give a year, whatever policy you have as far as accumulation of those sick leave, um, and even your vacation uh, um, policy, if you have people working in the summer and they can ac accumulate and accrue some vacation days, uh, you have that. And then you have the, the, the standard uh, family medical leave uh, that, that is allowed by, by, by federal law, the FMLA, which is 12 weeks of unpaid uh, you know, uh, vacation time. I mean, not vacation, I'm sorry. Um, time off uh, to either because of illness or, or to care for a family who is ill. Uh, but during this uh, pandemic specifically, the, the government, uh, the, the federal government enacted um, emergency family, family law um, um, uh, leave act, family leave act emergency, and it's called EFMLA. And also, uh, they enacted also an emergency uh, uh, sick paid leave um, as well. And first of all, we need to know that it covers specifically the period from April 1st to December 31st of 2020. So this is a law that if you know anything I say about it, it has to do with this time period. If it is to be extended further, uh, then it would need to uh, to be reenacted by by the federal government uh, for it to 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 take uh, effect. Um, um, and let me I'll speak to that a little bit, but I want to I want to kind of finish with this slide that that in front of me, um, and it says that on on March 19, the Equal Opportunity Commission issued an updated guidance um, on on the ADA, the American with Disabilities Act related to COVID-19, uh, uh, and it, it basically uh, said that covered employees, um, uh, that if they are experiencing symptoms of the pandemic, um, uh, you know, including cough, fever, chills, et cetera, um, uh, that, so let me, let me backtrack. ADA basically says that, that an employer cannot discriminate against uh, employees because of their health condition, um, uh, and that's even broader than, than disabilities, it's health condition. And as a part of that, for example, the, the, they, the employer cannot, cannot inquire about the health condition of, of an employee and cannot um, um, also just basically tell an employee, you, you need to, for example, have your, your temperature taken, um, or, or you need to leave, you know, go on, on leave uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason, and that even asking for a temperature is considered like a medical test, which which an employer would not be able to do. Uh, the new guidance from from uh, the EEOC basically said that because of the pandemic, specifically because of the pandemic, that if a person displays any symptom, uh, such as fever, chills, cough, etc., employer may, uh, first of all, may require uh, uh, that their, the temperature of the employee is taken. Same, by the way, for students. You can, you can ask for the temperature to be taken. And if they display one or more of the, of the symptoms, you may ask them to quarantine. And again, it's required an act for that to be, to be possible, um, um, for that to be possible. So um, if the school can ask, uh, can take the temperature of, of an employee, uh, can ask them to quarantine if they display uh, uh, symptoms. Ironically, not ironically, 
it's very important for the schools to know you cannot test or force test your teachers or your students for that matter. You cannot require them to be tested. You cannot require that. But you can guard against again the 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 the, the uh, uh, someone displaying any symptoms, and you can ask for temperature to be taken. You cannot. So some I heard on on different chats and different schools talking about. Well, we're going to require every teacher and every staff member to test before they come in. You cannot ask for that. You you cannot ask for that. Um, okay. So now we go to the emergency family medical leave act and. Uh, it requires schools with fewer than 500 employees, which basically I think it's every single Islamic school out there. Um, it, it requires them um, uh, to, um, uh, to give leave to its, it, it, its staff, um, um, and, and then it gives guidelines regarding that. This would include full-time and part-time employees, uh, employees who are currently on leave. Uh, uh, temporary employees, day laborers, workers. Uh, however, it excludes workers who are independent contractors um, um, and also employees who are unable to telework uh, because of school uh, uh, closure. All of these categories that were included, the, the, the law that was enacted, and again, it covers only from April 1 to December 31st. What it says is that the employees are eligible to have 12 weeks of paid leave in case of a closure of the school or b them being asked to go on quarantine because you know them specifically but also if the school as a whole closes because just like we saw in in uh, in, in in all the states actually i know in illinois for example all of a sudden you had the governor issuing an uh, an executive order uh, on march i think 15 asking for the schools to be closed until April 1st. In that case, the EFMLA basically says that you can have a, a, a paid leave under the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, a paid leave of up to 12 weeks, and, and it gets very tricky. Um, so here's how it goes. It is 12 weeks. However, the first two weeks, the first two weeks, you cannot get paid by the EFMLA, but you can do one of two things. Either if you have accumulated sick leave or if the school approves even vacation time that you can use to cover you during those two weeks. But if you don't have that, there's an emergency paid sick leave, but that would cover only up to 80 hours, which is two weeks, um, and, and only would cover uh, uh, two third of your salary, only two thirds of your salary, up to $200 a day and a maximum of $10,000. Um, again, if your school faced that situation, I know this, that many schools with a PPP loan, many schools, I know the schools I'm affiliated with, continue to pay their, to pay their teachers, especially that even during the first two weeks, the teachers, even though, even if there was no instruction, they were actually in a hurry preparing to, to provide online instructions. And in fact, I know firsthand that some teachers worked harder and longer hours during that time than they would have under a normal school day. Uh, and so I know that the schools using the PPP, um, they basically provided payment, but, but let's assume that that didn't happen. Or let's assume going forward, it happens again. Uh, this is what, what, what the EFMLA and the EPSL, EPSL stands for Emergency Paid Sick Leave, and the other one is Emergency Family Medical Leave Act. It provides that the, fam, the EFMLA provides for 12 weeks paid leave, two thirds of the salary, up to $200 a day, maximum of 10,000, starting with the first day of the third week of leave. And um, uh, the first two weeks would be covered either by the accrued sick leave of an employee, in that case, they get paid the full, full amount, or if, if they have consumed all of that, they then uh, can fall under the EPSL, the emergency paid sick leave, which would give them again two thirds of their, of their pay um, if they have to be uh, laid off. The only other thing I wanna 
cover on that is, is the EFMLA is not a standalone. It works in conjunction with the FMLA, which many of you, I'm sure, if not all of you know, that FMLA is, is a law that basically says that an employee who needs to take off for, for, for health reasons for themselves or uh, a close family member, um, that they are entitled to 12 weeks of unpaid sick leave. Uh, so that th this law, by the way, said that, that your maximum time off cannot exceed 12 weeks. And so if you have taken already for some reason or another in the previous 12 months, let's say four weeks of unpaid leave for whatever reason, you only qualify for eight weeks of EFML. You don't qualify for for the 12. And that is true even if your if if your FMLA falls under two separate 12 months, meaning meaning if your 12 months run from June of 2019 to June of 2020 and July 1st, 2020, you get a new period, uh, that doesn't make it 24 weeks of um, or, or uh, yeah, 20, 24 weeks of EFMLA. It will remain the same amount even if it straddles two different years um, um, in, in this case. Um, additional legal considerations for the staff. Um, uh, all the considerations in the law, by the way, assumes that, that there is no other provisions that, uh, that governs the relationship. And again, the relationship between a, a, a teacher or any staff member or any administrator and the school is, is a contractual one. So you may have in the contract something that is either, you know, that is more generous than what the law allows, but all of, of those provisions, uh, um, um, you know, assume that you don't have any, any other obligations that the school obligated itself for uh, you know, through its own uh, contract um, um, with the with the staff member. Um, uh, generally, employers have the right to implement changes to our conditions during a global health crisis, provided the employer provides notice and guidance to the employees in regard to those changes. Uh, that's related to again um, requiring you know uh, telework or or or, or requiring um, a modified. Um, 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 calendar, uh, for example, um, once employee has leveraged the complete two weeks of of, uh, of FFCRA, they are able to exercise the use of the accrued leave again. And I explained that actually regarding the the, the FMLA and the EFMLA. Uh, workman's compensation that's an important uh, item. Workman's compensation will be able to provide employees with coverage if they had contracted COVID-19. However, the burden is on the employee to prove that he or she ex were exposed at work. Uh, that's another thing is that, you know, if, if an employee uh, uh, contract COVID, uh, God forbid, uh, and they have to be uh, treated, then workman, workman's comp should and, and you know, the, the insurance has to cover them. However, they, they have to show that they contracted the, the disease at the school, not at the supermarket, not at the restaurant, not, not in other places. Um, in terms of unemployment, uh, the CARES Act has allowed an expansion of unemployment benefits and has allowed some states additional flexibility. So that also, you know, would apply as well, separate, and I've mentioned that already. Uh, employers cannot force an employee to undergo a medical exam prior to working without running afoul of the ADA. I mentioned that. However, the CDC guidelines uh, allow uh, the employer to take employees' temperature. During a pandemic, employers may ask employees if they experience symptoms. They cannot themselves check them for those symptoms, but they may ask them about those symptoms. Again, uh, under normal circumstances, employer is not allowed even to ask about, about anything related to health, actually. Um, and employers can send an employee home uh, if they have, uh, if they are ex uh, uh, experiencing or, or exhibiting any of the symptoms of COVID. Um, this is just kind of, um, um, you know, as far as the remote wor working conditions, some considerations that need to be kept in mind. First, enact a policy, a specific policy. 
that sets your expectations from teachers and staff members if they do telework. Um, your job duties, work conditions, uh, hours, uh, everything you expect, you need to put into policy. You cannot expect that, that you'd say, go telecommute or telework and, and you provide no guidance. And then you tell them, but you didn't do this or you, you, you penalize them for something they, they chose to do that you haven't provided guidance on. Set a policy. You need to have a policy for teleworking. Uh, the other thing is that, especially for hourly uh, workers, you need to make sure that you have timekeeping uh, procedures so you don't run afoul of, of, of the Wage Act. Um, um, and you, you don't open yourself. Uh, and again, I, I can tell you, especially in Islamic schools, many of the teachers put many more hours um, uh, in and, and, and um, many staff members who are not teachers who usually you know, clock their hours put in more hours, um, um, many of them actually just never even would think about uh, submitting uh, you know, overtime or submitting additional hours. But if that happens, if, if you tell somebody go work from home and they submit 60 hours of work for a 40 hour week, unless you have provided you know, guidance and, and, and policy and bylaw, and, I mean, and, and uh, guidance uh, for them, um, you have to deal with that and you have to address that and, 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 and you may be uh, you know, on the hook for, for additional pay if you do not have a timekeeping method as well as a policy in place. The final thing on that regard, the consideration, it's very, very important consideration is that you need to make sure that in your policy, in all your communications, that your teleworking conditions are not permanent, are temporary due to unusual, extraordinary circumstances. Um, uh, because if you don't, that can be then later on used to say, well, you could use teleworking permanently for me as a reasonable accommodation. And in some cases, that may be the case. In some cases, that may be true, and the employer may, may decide, you know what, after we tried it, those positions, one, two, three, four, um, they can be done both you know, in-house or at home, or part of it can be done at home, but you are not going to uh, uh, have the choice of going back to full face-to-face -face employment if someone is under the ADA and claim that they need that as a reasonable accommodation and that they point to the fact that you actually successfully did it for a while. Um, you know, putting in your communications and your policy and your directives that this is temporary, this is extraordinary circumstances of a pandemic, and that's the only reason we're doing this, um, is important to protect yourself against that claim in the future. Um, the next uh, thing that, that um, I, I um, addressed is if we go for, for online instruction, and again, some schools may already have consulted with their legal advisors, they already have policies in place, some of them may have done it on the fly with no policies, um, and again, everybody was very understanding. Uh, I go back to that one important you know, phrase that I use, due diligence, or, or uh, you know, word that I use, due diligence. In, on April 15, 2020, due diligence is different than due diligence in August or September of 2020. So, so there are things, for example, that those of you who went on video conferencing, if you exercise that and if you had that, that there are things perhaps that could have opened you to some liability um, regarding teacher-student interaction, regarding the, 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 um, the circumstances in the house, or, or where the teacher sometimes uh, logged on and, and went on, on the video. What did they have in the background? What did they dress? A different thing. You may have had some, some kind of leeway uh, back then, but if this is gonna happen and happen over a full semester, possibly over a full year, possibly on some level permanently down the road, um, if that's the case, then you really have to implement and put in place policies that are very specific, that are spelled out about teacher-student interaction, about you know, um, uh, you know, what is to be expected, uh, what is to be expected basically uh, 
uh, in, in those regards. Now, my, my own preference, and again, consult with your legal uh, counsel, this is not a legal advice, my own preference that video conferencing never be allowed one-on-one -on -one between a student and teacher, period. In small groups, it's different, where you, like a Zoom situation or a Google Classroom situation, that's different. Um, but even there, you are, you are well advised to provide a very concrete, very specific uh, uh, policy on, on what is okay, what is not okay. Um, again, my, my own preference is that no one-on-one -on -one video conferencing between a student and a teacher under any circumstances. And in, in, in small groups or in, in groups, it is allowed under severe, you know, uh, um, um, severe um, uh, restrictions. Or not severe, but, but reasonable or strong restrictions. Now, the other issue as far as one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication, I would say um, uh, email is appropriate. However, please make sure that you expressly uh, let your teachers know that they cannot use their private email to communicate with students. They must use a school provided email and that email must be one that can be accessed by school administration or personnel or appropriate uh, you know, person and it is only you know, used for, for school related stuff, et cetera. Um, th th those are the, the two like, things that stand out for me um, in, in this regard, but, but every school is absolutely well advised um, that if they are going online, um, whether short term or long term, uh, because of COVID, that they enact policies in place that regulate and highly regulate the, the online interactions between students and teachers. Make sure that there are certain things that are expressly and clearly and not allowed, and, and then you know other things to be. Um, uh, uh, to be spelled out. And again, best practices are coming out. Um, you know, there are, uh, um, you know, workshops that are being, being put together, uh, talking about the best way to do this. Uh, um, many organizations are, are putting out, um, and, and at the end of the day, you choose what works for you and your school. You give it to your legal counsel to look at it and review it. And then you implement it, you, you basically make sure that your parents, you communicated with your parents, your staff, your students, and, and then you stick to it uh, uh, going forward. Um, I just want to very quickly make sure that I didn't uh, skip any of the uh, bullet points, communicate with parents regarding the scope of the school distance program. I just mentioned that uh, specifically describe the distance learning program, explain various ways in which online platforms may be used for both uh, um, asynchronous or not learning. Uh, school utilizing live video as part of the plan. Communicate to parents and students the expectations. Uh, okay, disclose whether video conferencing will be recorded. That's something I didn't mention. Make sure that if you are recording, you must let them know that. Uh, again, establish uh, school policies for faculty and students. Um, um, and 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 the one thing also. Uh, parent consent. Make sure you have a parent consent if you in, uh, in, enact a, a learning program. So like similar to the parent consent, so here's how, how it goes. Um, like similar to, to um, uh, parent consents that you have at the beginning of the school year uh, for photography, for, for uh, going on field trips, etc. Uh, you need to create a, an additional one basically that, that talks about um, the fact that there's distant learning and, and, and spell out what the parents are consenting to uh, related to uh, the communication between their student and the school uh, and what platform is being utilized and, and, and provide them also with, again, the tools for them to understand um, um, what the platform is uh, and, and, and be able to consent to it with knowledge. Uh, Again, I would just want to make sure that all the bullet points have been covered. Uh, require faculty to utilize the distant learning platform designated by the school. Again, not, not prohibit the use of cell phones, 
personal emails, I mentioned that already. Remind students and faculty, obviously, I mean, that, that should be spelled out in a policy about what is conversation, appropriate conversation topics. I'm reminding faculty to be aware of backgrounds, environments. Again, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned that you have to really be very careful about spelling out down to, again, what, what can you wear and cannot wear? Uh, what kind of background you, you can have and cannot have? What kind of general environment, uh, for example? Can other people be, be all of a sudden uh, exposed to, to um, you know, without them knowing, just they walk into a room and all of a sudden, you know, maybe you will mandate that it's a specific location with a, with a wall as the background, uh, with nobody that can pass behind you. I mean, I would say, you know, you cannot be too careful about making sure that you have done your homework as far as, uh, you know, what are your expectations? Uh, clearly define, you know, what your expectations are. And again, even though one of the bullet points it says clearly define the purpose of the one-on-one -on -one meetings, my preference is no one-on-one -on -one meeting, conference meetings under any circumstances. To me, even even ver uh, even uh, through like a, a phone, I, I would say that always, always make sure that it is through email that is owned by the school or in small groups but not one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and, and finally, in your school policies to faculty, make sure that the that, 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 that faculty has the obligation of informing you as an administration of anything unusual that may arise, any happening that, that can make them concerned or, or any, any behavior on behalf. You have students that, that can, can raise liability for the school, uh, they need to, to be able to, um, uh, <coughs> uh, they have the affirmative obligation to, to inform you as a school of, of that. Uh, the next topic related to tuition refunds, again, um, um, that's one of the issues that can become a problem. Um, and many parents actually, and many of the assigned schools had to either give discounts or or to, you know, do considerations regarding the, you know, um, the, 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 the tuitions and, and many of them receive a lot of tuition refund requests. Um, so legally, again, let, let's, let's start from, from the bottom. The relationship between you and the parents is contractual. You have a contract of service. You are providing them and their child through their child a service and they're paying you for that service. Now the, the the good news, if you can call it that, uh, there, it's a settled law that uh, just like universities and many of us going through the university sticks in our head more because all of us, just about all of us had to deal with it at one point or another. You know how the school says, if you attend up until first day of school, we refund you 100%. You attend one class, we refund you 80%. By the second week, we refund you 50%. By the third week, you can drop, but you don't get any money back. That kind of logic applies even for, for regular schools. The, the, the law is settled that once school starts and a certain amount of time passes um, and the school can decide what that time is, whether it's two weeks, whether it's one month, whether it's whatever, there is no refund of the tuition. And, and the reason, by the way, uh, by the way uh, for those of you who haven't uh, come across this before, and the logic is, uh, is very simple, is that, um, if I have, uh, let's say, if I have um, 30 kids enrolled in a classroom, I may as a school, or 32 kids, let's put it that way. Let's say I have 32 kids enrolled in second grade. So as a school, I make a decision to hire a, an additional teacher, pay for a full teacher, make, make an additional room available, incur all the expenses of making that room available, and split those 32 kids or 34 kids or whatever, to two, two grades uh, or two uh, sections and have two sections of that grade. Now I incurred the, the, the salary of a teacher, I incurred at least fifty sixty thousand dollars $60,000 additional expenses as a school. Um, and then let's say after school starts by, by three weeks, four weeks, five students drop. And now I all, I'm all of a sudden have 27 kids or 25 kids and I no longer need even two, two uh, classrooms, but I'm stuck. As a school, I have to continue with that mode. So, so the, the courts have said that the school 
have to budget and plan and incur expense that cannot be reversed when the enrollment go down or when a parent leaves. So as a result, we are gonna allow the school to say, if I built my school year budget and school year based on a certain enrollment and your child and your child's tuition was counted as part of that, then once you join and a, and a reasonable amount of time, and usually it's only like a couple of weeks or a month, is passed by, the school, if you decide to withdraw, the school doesn't have to give you your money back. So, so that's a settled law. Now the, the trick there and what the difference in this case, a parent may say, um, I didn't wanna withdraw, uh, uh, but the school closed. Uh, and, and, and there there's something called uh, force majeure, um, as well as there are other legal terms that, that kind of allow both parties kind of to terminate the contract. But, but I, can, I can tell you safely that from a legal perspective, from a legal perspective, the school really is not obligated to refund, uh, to refund tuition to, to, to parents. Uh, from, a, from a community perspective, from an economic perspective, from, from you know, uh, being able to keep your enrollment perspective, that, that's a different issue. The school may choose to give partial refund or give, uh, uh, you know, refund some of the tuition back or whatever, but that's really all of it is not related to um, uh, to the school having to do that legally. But the school is advised to consider whether it can provide some some refund. Now, some schools, by the way, you know, they decided to refund some some of like activities, like if they charge. $200 for the soccer team and, and, and if they charge something for an activity that stopped, they, they may have provided partial and they may provide partial. And some may argue that in that case, the parents can go after that amount, but normally those amounts are, are not very you know, big to where they, they end up in lawsuits and stuff. But in general, the, the, the idea is for the most part, and again, this is not a legal advice. Don't take it to the bank. You still need to consult with your local legal, legal counsel or your specific legal counsel. Uh, but in general, schools are not obligated to give refunds, um, uh, you know, in those cases. Now, if the school closes for the entire year and it ceases to have to pay its employees or something major happens, there are, again, some legal terms that come in like impossibility or impracticality or frustration of purpose that, that, that can come into play that causes you to do refund. But the way things went this last two months of last year, or the way now we are gonna proceed with blended learning, all of that, the school has no obligation to, to do refunds from a legal perspective. But again, it, it, it is advisable that that be very, very clearly spelled out in your contracts um, um, with the parents um, and, and make sure that they fully understand what they are signing on to. But at the end of the day, it is a contractual obligation between or a relation between you and the parents uh, as far as the tuition is concerned. And the legal precedent is that once the school starts and it's you know a reasonable uh, amount of time passes, there's no refunds to be expected. Waivers. When people talk about waivers, there's two two things. There's one talking about reducing like number of school days or or canceling given a specific assessments, and that by the way relates also to to uh, schools that have specially that have again voucher students. They have added added responsibility towards their states to to do specific testing, uh, have specific accountabilities that that the average non-public school doesn't have. Uh, uh, but basically, because of COVID, um, the the federal government and the Department of U.S. Department of Education did allow states to submit applications uh, to be able to ask for a waiver on one thing or another without them being affected as far as federal funding. And again, many states enacted themselves laws that allow for waivers of certain. Um, uh, accountability, but this is really not something in the hand of schools. And I just, I, I threw it in there just to let people know that 
you can't automatically decide you are gonna you know cut out 20 days of the school year or cut out uh, the number of, or cut the number of face-to-face -face instructions automatically or or automatically decide that a certain online instruction will will be accepted or or can be accepted in lieu of face-to-face -face instruction all of those things you need to to have a waiver from your state board of education and they themselves or state department of education and they themselves have to seek waiver from the federal government on some of that stuff i just want you to to realize that um, and that's why you know I, I i included this the other waiver that a lot of people spoke about and 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 again there's a lot of uh, noise about it is um i'm sorry i tried to huh? what's happening here um i have a uh, so again okay here we go i think now i have it no it's not so it's not allowing me to open the waiver but as i mentioned you are going to get get copy of this um of this presentation and I know that Word document then will open for you easily. For some reason, when I hover close to it or over it, it's not allowing me to, to, to open the document. Um, and so, but the document is a student waiver. And basically it says, it, it basically says that I as the parent of students so-and-so are aware that enrolling my child in your school for the fall of 2021, uh, that a, that my children are gonna be exposed to the following. There's the potential of them contracting the following and that I'm fully aware and, and I'm fully aware that the results of that can result in you know, them contracting COVID, uh, you know, this or that happening to them, et cetera. And I understand all of that and I waive any liability or any, and waive any uh, uh, responsibility of the school towards my child if they enroll this school year. That's basically what it says. Um, and again, you can, you can use it. Again, my, my, I would say my advice is that, not my advice. I am not endorsing this document. Uh, it's not something that you can take and just go implement tomorrow and say, we were given this from an attorney. You have to uh, uh, consult your local, your local uh, an individual counsel. Uh, before you 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 enact this, but let me tell you that um, nobody knows whatsoever whether this would fly in court. Nobody knows, and nobody can assure you. Um, is having it better than not having it? It I would say it will not hurt, uh, but it you know having it. What 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 I guess want to make sure of that none of you be under the illusion that if we develop something like this, run it by our council and then have the parents sign it, now if, they, if something happens, we're covered. Nobody can assure you of that, none whatsoever. Uh, but it is something that you would wanna consider, you would wanna think about. Um, again, if your local council uh, advise you that it, it's, it's a good thing to go with, I would say, you know, go for it. Um, uh, in that case, but but still, it, it, don't be under any illusion that this is you know a, a shield or this is a you know an answer or, you know uh, th that is uh, you know we probably God forbid uh, and in reality it's going to happen. We are not going to know the effectiveness of it until until somebody contract the disease, they sue their school. Uh, it goes before the court, the court makes its decision and then, and then set a precedent as to what works, what doesn't, what specific language would be appropriate, what specific things would be appropriate to cover, et cetera. Uh, but I would say, you know, it, it's not a bad idea to, to think about it, to consider it, to discuss it with your, with your legal counsel and if they advise you to adopt it, you go ahead and do that. Um, as much as uh, the student waivers, um, been the topic and as far as you know i just worried about some people thinking that this is the answer uh, um, you know and that this is something once they have everything is okay i just don't want you to be under that illusion because this has not been tried nobody knows how the courts will react nobody knows you know wh whether whether the fact that you have that waiver given that by the way um, uh, this is a waiver regarding attending school. 
by the way, parents sign all the time waivers for their kids participating in sports, you know, saying that I know this sport is can expose my child to, to being injured. I know to, you know, this, that, whatever. And I am still, you know, willing to have my child uh, participate and I will waive any responsibility. But as some of you may know already through experience and some of you know through, through having, uh, having maybe sat through uh, legal presentations related to school, know that there are many, many cases with those waivers on file for sports, which is an auxiliary activity, not a mandated activity. Uh, and still some courts would, in spite of the waiver say, nope, the school is gonna be liable still anyway. So, so just be careful about that and, and, and be aware of that. This waiver is similar to that sports and extracurricular and summer school waivers. It's very similar. It seeks the same type of protection, but whether it is effective or not, we won't be able to tell unless and until there's litigation and there's there's precedent set by the court, etc. Um, I think that covers it. Again, my disclaimer once again, please. And I know I repeated it enough time that everybody, uh, I hope, is aware that this is just sharing of information uh, to enable you to be able to uh, ask your attorney the right questions, to know the right issues to worry about. Um, to you know, to to, but it's not a legal advice in any way, and that you need to seek. The, 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 the advice of a, of a licensed professional in your, in your locality uh, that you have a client, attorney-client relationship with. And that's the end of that for me. I will turn it over to Sister Sophia. Uh, I have not been able to see any questions uh, as I have only my presentation on the screen, but I'll close it now, hopefully, so I can... Uh, um, uh, you know, continue inshallah with the qu uh, question and answer. So I'm gonna stop the share so I can get back, um, being able to see everybody and be able to see uh, any questions that can be presented. Jazakumullah khair for, for listening to me for close to an hour and 15 minutes straight. Uh, inshallah, there will be uh, questions and answer that, that can help us uh, understand the, the the legal issues we are facing uh, due to this uh, pandemic and be able to deal with it and negotiate it as best uh, as Islamic schools. Thank you, Brother Safat. Uh, Alhamdulillah, no, that was very, very useful. Uh, we do have some questions. One I just want to clarify, um, well, a couple of them are, are clar clarification questions. You had said that the one-on-one -on -one meeting, your suggestion, your strong advice was that there should not be any one-on-one -on -one video meetings taking place. The, uh, one of the participants is asking, um, we, they do have one-on-one -on -one meetings taking place on school, on campus, so why not on video? So, so there, there you have the, the you know, there you have the, the precaution of, so for example, if I'm a teacher meeting with a student one-on-one -on -one in my classroom, the classroom door is open. Anyone can walk in anytime and walk out. If I'm a counselor, you know, um, I guess the council have a little bit more privacy, but even there, you know, th there is circumstances around you that will protect you against any claims of impropriety. Uh, if it is one-on-one -on -one video uh, conference, I mean, think of all the social media uh, issues, uh, you know, that, that, that arise from kids in the middle of the night being on a, on a device where they can see somebody and they can see them and, and you know, nobody else is privy to that, nor is anybody else able to be privy to that. Uh, so really it's because of that, uh, in that, in that, that the video conferencing one-on-one -on -one can exclude effectively just about anybody else if the two people participating wish to do so. A school, doesn't, a school setting doesn't afford you that. And by the way, if a school setting affords you that, then that is an area you need to look at as a possible liability area for your school. And uh, someone's asking, what if the teacher obtains consent and records the one-on-one -on -one meeting? That's different. Uh, and, and, and that's a good point, the recording aspect of it. Uh, the only thing again there, and, and that's why really my advice was more of an educator advice than necessarily someone who's looking for a foolproof legal you know, protection. Um, uh, in the sense that 
if you record it, if you record the session in full, I would say that that, that can especially, you know, yeah, I mean, that can afford you uh, a protection. The problem there also, if you are, if, um, you know, then that, that is like something that can be obtained, uh, reviewed, um, can raise other issues for you as, as, a, as an educator. And some of it may be legal, some of it may not be legal. Like if a student is sharing with you something um, th that is um, like a counselor situation, for example, that, that you know, it, it, it can raise issues. But definitely, I would say, if it is being fully recorded, that, that would make me feel a lot better, a lot more comfortable with it being utilized. All I'm saying is that it's like somebody telling me, I, I, I wanna, I have to clean the gutters on the edge of my uh, house and I need to, you know, get on the edge and, and, and lean over and all of that. I tell them, you have to clean the gutter, but make sure not to fall. That the, your, your, your potential of falling off is high and you need to be very, very super careful. It's that kind of approach. I mean, this is the one area that if, if a teacher is gonna be gone or a school is gonna be gone, that's one very vulnerable area. Okay, you had uh, said that a school can take temp the temperature of a faculty member or students as they come to school, but you cannot require them to be tested. Now, the clarification on that, so you're saying that you cannot require them, a student or staff member, to get COVID testing, if they even if they show symptoms or if they've been ex uh, if they've been known to be exposed to even if they show symptoms, you can you can uh, uh, quarantine them. You can force them to leave the school setting. You cannot force them to test. Okay. Um, so you can't require them to get tested and provide you provide the school with the results. Uh, not requiring no. Can't require. Not okay. requiring. Uh, and again, this is the, the state of the law now. I'm not sure if, if, if you know, the way now there's an uptick of, of cases, there's more, more, more legislation coming through. It may get to a point where certain people, like teachers, like, you know, first responders, et cetera, it may become okay and the, there may be legislation that, that will allow for them, for the school to require that. But at this point, it is not the case. A question about the recordings also came up there in the, in the discussions. If the school obtains permission to record the Zoom class sessions and then makes them available, is that okay to, that they're available on the school website and so forth once the permission is there? I would say those are two separate permissions. So there's okay. one permission to record um, and use internally for whatever reason and then the other one for the school to use that externally with the public or put it online or stuff like that. So it, it oh. is two different. The school is, so okay. My advice would be, and my preference would be, again, I'm, I'm using the word preference, not advice, because I'm not advising you legally. My preference would be, uh, in, in this case, is to, um, is to obtain a separate permission for that recording to be shared anywhere beyond the administration and the, and the school setting. Okay. And then I don't know if you have it anywhere in the um, links that you provided, but people were asking about any specific verbiage that you have that schools can add to their contracts or to their registration materials, um, anything that's, you know. I, I, again, I mean, I, I can I can go through and compile some examples, uh, but you know because of the fact that that we have people from different states, different juris jurisdictions, uh, it, it, it's very slippery slope for me to provide something and say you can use this. Um, uh, but I guess if it is compiled with a reference as to where this is coming from, and with a disclaimer at the bottom of the thing saying that still you must clear this by your legal counsel, uh, possibly that's, um, that, you know, that would be okay. So I don't have a problem compiling a few examples um, and then Cisna can make them available to, to everybody with that caveat. Okay. And going back again to the testing, if, if a 
a, a, a staff member or a student show symptoms. Let's say, you know, you took their temperature, they showed symptoms. You said that you cannot require them to be tested, but you can require them to be quarantined. Yes. So you can say, you could say, come back in two weeks and if, as long as you don't have a fever. Exactly. But you cannot require them to show you a result of a test. They can voluntarily show it to you. Right. You can suggest to them that, uh, and again, I mean, a, a result of a test, see that now we go more on, on, a, on, on the healthcare side of it, and I don't want to run afoul of that. Uh, that's not my expertise, but from a legal perspective, I, I would say that if someone themselves voluntarily tests and come back to you and say, listen, I tested, this was just a, a flu, and four days later, here's my test, or five days later, here's my test, and it's negative, and they don't have the symptoms, I imagine that you can, you can take that from them and not force them to be gone the whole two weeks. Um, uh, but you cannot tell them you must go and test and demand that test from them. So I guess people are comparing it to, you know, when, it, when a lot of our schools have something in their handbooks, when a child has been out sick, they, there's a do doctor's note that's required for them to be able to come back. Yeah. So can we compare it to that? Like, do they, would they have to have a doctor's note to be able to return? Or would it be enough to be out for two weeks, quarantine, come back without a I fever? That symptoms. You know, and I wonder if that's not, that's, maybe that's something that you can't yeah. answer. That might be something that yeah. CDC or the local health um, mm -hmm. departments would yeah. have. No, I would make a note of it as, I mean, that comparison to a regular note from a doctor for a flu is, is, a, is a good comparison. So I, I, will, I will look into that further. I don't want to give a, a, a straight sure. answer. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, you know, when I was mentioning all of this about you cannot require testing, it was more because of the ADA and in relation to employees. And it, it, it's possible there's a distinction between them and the students, but I want to research that before I, I, I would give a definitive answer. Yeah. We have someone, um, and actually participants, you're able to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question in person. I just don't want it to become too chaotic. Um, with everyone chiming in, but one of our participants is an MD, PhD, and he's saying it would be a good practice to have a doctor's note. And then another question is, a lot of, a lot of things that you mentioned, Brother Safai, and I know I understand why you're saying it, every state is different. Many schools do not have um, in-house legal counsel. And are you recommending now, I mean, maybe at this time, it is important to have legal advice from someone who's familiar with state laws and school law specifically. Uh, and and the, 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 I mean, the, the right, um, you don't have to have an in-house counsel, actually. And even public schools, overwhelming majority of them don't have in-house counsel. Like Chicago Public School have a few in-house counsels, but overwhelming majority of even districts that have several schools don't have an on-staff counsel. Uh, but that means you need to, to consult with a, an attorney who is a school law attorney that can review and then give you the okay as far as in, you know, a certain policy or a certain, I, I would say definitely that, that that would be my advice is that is that run those uh, policies, you know, by 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 a legal counsel that doesn't have to be. You have to have a client attorney client relationship with them. You do not have to have them in house or them being your permanent counsel or have to to be obligated to them in any uh, you know long term way. Another, um, uh, so by the way, I saw a comment uh, that said that I think it was, it said Lake County, Lake County some mm -hmm. county that, that says that you can require a doctor's note. And that's the caveat that I would say. It is it, it, that your local health officials or government officials uh, uh, or uh, school education officials, meaning the State Board of Education or the Department of Education in your state, they can. Uh, you know, issue something that says a school can do this. Uh, and if your county, if your, if your state board of education issued that, yes, you can demand uh, a, a note from the student, then you can comfortably and, and without any problem say in your policy that we're going to demand that and, and that will be fine. You had um, on your, one of your slides waiver for students. 
is there also something can, can the school also require employees to sign similar waivers or so, that, so, like, there, uh, so there because you have a workman's comp i believe that excludes uh, forcing staff members to sign waivers uh, because there i mean you, you have you have the workman's comp um, specifically, you know, you pay your, your workman's comp insurance as a school specifically. So, so in cases of, of, of uh, injuries to, to teachers uh, for, for them to be covered. So, so I believe that that's preclude having additional, uh, additional waivers. So I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has some questions or if Sister Leila, if you'd like to. Oh, I think, um, let's see. Let's see, brother. Uh, another very important question all of us are asking and then it didn't, let's see. What do you include in the student waiver that pre prevents one parent from suing another parent? Mm. Mm. I really don't, I don't know if that's something the school can, can, can require put itself in the middle of, yeah. I, I mean, in America, literally, if you have $500 in your pocket, you can sue anybody and nobody can stop nobody from suing. <laughs> I don't think there's anything in the waiver that, that you can put that prevents people from suing each other. It's like two kids fighting on the playground. Um, you know, you only can worry about the liability of the school of, you know, having done everything possible to prevent that fight, to, 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 to make sure that if there's, you know, they, they followed whatever policies to, to ensure the safety of the student. But if the two parents want to go after each other because one kid injured the other, the school can't step in the middle of that. And it can't prevent it. Uh, uh, they can be called on as a witness, but they cannot prevent it. Mm. Um, I, I just wanted to reiterate um, the point about taking into consideration your own local authorities, but also your community and being very specific in your guidelines. I think um, when you're looking at protocol and procedures and processes, that being very specific in this year's handbook, like the, this year's handbook for parents and students is going to be quite different from last year's. And it's going to have to have literally step one, two, three, four for everything that you do. And taking the time to really go through that and then um, like Brother Safa recommended, is then sending that document to legal counsel to review. Because sometimes we put things in there that we can't, we find out that you're not allowed to really put in there. And then they, they can add language that um, protects us a little bit better. And the other thing I wanted to touch on is this one-on-one -on -one communication through video. Um, I would really, uh, I don't want to, again, um, really ask you to reflect on that. What is the need for that one-on-one -on -one video conferencing session? And is this really the type of communication that you want and, and think about the, the other problems? It's not just legal problems. There, there can be a whole slew of things that come out of that. So I would, I would caution um, everyone not to go into this realm. I'm dealing with one organization that had youth working on projects that things came up because they were using personal phones to contact um, the high school students and then doing individual meetings. And we were dealing with a lot of um, problems because of that. And so I would caution anyone not to go in that direction. I don't, I don't really foresee what the need or urgency would be to have one-on-one -on -one meetings that you couldn't have a third party in or a fourth party in. Um, and that's it. And I, I thank you, Brother Safa. That was really, um, really comprehensive information. Sure. I, I saw actually two, two questions coming through. I didn't catch the first. I caught the second, so let me address that. Uh, somebody is saying that right now that the recommendation is six feet apart. Uh, if you cannot maintain six feet, you know, uh, or you need to maintain six feet, but is any less than six feet uh, okay? So if I understand it correctly, unless your local, um, uh, you know, government uh, or local health officials have something different, um, the way I understand it is that you are to aim to have six feet. If you cannot then face mask um, and other, you know, some even suggested that you can have um, a, a see-through shield that, that 
You know how students, when you, don't, you give them exam and they are too close, you don't want them to cheat, they put like a threefold thing that prevents them from seeing or the other, that, you know, there, there are even some, you know, suggestions to that, um, to, to do something like that, where at the student desk, they have this around them. So if they speak, their dro uh, droplets don't, don't, don't fly, et cetera. Um, uh, but it is not, if I understand it correctly, it's not a hard and fast six feet, even in the CDC, uh, you know, it's not six feet under any circumstances. There are, it is like in lieu of, and that if you have, uh, you know, a mask or coverage that, that guarantees that, that your driplets is not gonna fly, then I think there are, there are ways around it. But I would say, to me, I leave that to the local health officials as well as the state, you know, some states have taken it upon themselves, state board of education to give specific guidance, then you follow that. But it, absent that, I, I think it, it's a bit more uh, flexible than, than a strict absolute six feet. Yeah. And actually, um, Dr. Abdul uh, Majid Mukhtari, he posted in the chat box, and it's very important. I don't know if everyone got a chance to see it, but what he's saying is, Keep in mind that school leader is neither a professional healthcare provider nor a licensed counselor. So please don't play the role of these two professionals. Only refer students, parents, staff to licensed healthcare and counselors. And I think that's really good Absolutely. advice. And they are not attorneys either. So <laughs> yes. they, are, they are not licensed counselors, not licensed healthcare professionals. They are not licensed attorneys. So yes, so they need to be very cautious. And, and this is one time where it, it it, it is good for them to constantly refer to the experts. Because again, I mean, I thank the doctor for the comment and, and this goes back to what I started with this issue of due diligence. In a changing situation when there is no precedent and it's new and everybody is, is, is going, you know, flying by the seat of their pants, because, you know, the only thing the court will hold you to is that under the circumstances you did your due diligence. Under the circumstances, you didn't play a medical doctor. You didn't play a licensed professional. You went to the experts. And if the experts told you do ABC and you did it, and ABC turned to be wrong, then you are still okay because you did what the expert told you at the time and there was no settled you know, procedures or guidelines or, or, or you know, uh, law at the time when you had to take that decision. He also mentions um, how about mask related legal issues, respiratory issues, oxygen intake reductions. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. And actually, I just read this morning uh, that they are now talking about uh, the fact that um, they, they may be like mandating installing specific filters that will, that will um, basically filter the, the COVID virus itself. It's still in production or something. Um, and, and that the mask is not, you know, uh, yeah, either it's causing some respiratory. I would say from what I read is that you can make exceptions to people who show that they cannot, they cannot wear the mask for medical reasons, but you have to have other precautions in place for them. Um, but, but that's really, it's still up in the air. It's still really uh, developing. And, and I worry about, you know, um, many people claiming, and especially that we see already, you know, all over every day, people as a matter of what they say, my right not to wear the mask, my, you know, first amendment right, et cetera. Um, I, that's something I, I'm not prepared to, to even give a final opinion on saying you must, I, I mean, obviously as a private Islamic schools, you can always set a policy and say, if you don't abide by it, you, you know, you, you cannot join our school, um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I need to think about this a little bit more. To, to just allow exceptions that can open a door, uh, to say everybody has to do it, then again, you are playing the role of a, of a medical professional. So that is a little bit of dicey situation that, that we still have to, uh, to see in the next month where it goes. Again, that can be resolved by having by having legislation that allow you to do certain things and not do certain things. And obviously legislation usually, they are based on you know, professionals submitting their reports as to what is medically or otherwise you know, 
uh, advisable and, and they take that into consideration, but it still really is up in the air. I, I couldn't advise you one way or another, um, uh, one way or another um, on that. I would say, let's see the next month, uh, what would the final policy on face masks, masks will be in, in the schools. Um, yeah. yeah. One more, uh, sorry, one more thing that came in. Um, the legal issues in terms of live streaming classes, if a school is only doing distance learning or, or hybrid, and then the students have their, or, um, their faces or voices in, in the live stream, is, what are the legal, is it the same? Again, yeah, I mean, you would get, you would get a consent from the parent and, and that consent would be sufficient. Yeah. yeah. So you can't force students to be on camera or they have to. Uh, I mean, even without the legal aspect of it, I can see legitimate reasons why some people would not want to be on camera. I can tell you that, for example, I mean, I know two, two schools that actually started with allowing uh, Google Classroom, allowing some face-to-face -face and on Zoom, and then they really went into where they don't, um, they, they wanted everybody to, to, um, to not use the video and just be, be on, on audio. So um, again, whether to mandate everybody, I would say that's an overreach that even not from a legal perspective, I would, I would, I would try to avoid, I'll try to carve exceptions for people who cannot open the video if they don't need to, or if they don't want to. Yeah, it's another dicey, dicey question. Um, I don't know if you can mandate them to open the video. Um, perhaps if you have sufficient, um, sufficient um, specifications about where they would be sitting and what would be, you know, like the, the, the manner in which they, they, they are opening the video and what, what is being shown, you may be able to mandate it. But I, I would, I, it, it's one of those things that it doesn't make me feel comfortable to say you can or should uh, uh, force them to open the video. Yeah, and I think the reason um, teachers or administrators wanted students to be seen on cameras to make sure they're actually present. That's true. That, that's true. Turn it on Although and walk away. <laughs> you heard about kids that were able to put their their the shot of them sitting and yes and and move walked away and teachers couldn't even tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but yeah, I I can see that. I, again, th those are I, this thing is developing as we speak. Those are some of the things that we need to hone in. Uh, uh, on and and every school, I would say, make its own decision of what works for it and what doesn't. Right. I think you mentioned early on that that relationship and that communication with parents. This is part of that conversation that parents understand why, if you want the students on camera, why it's important. Yes. And if there's an exception that needs to be made, there needs to be a real reason for that exception. Yeah. But again, that open communication with the parents is important. Mm -hmm. And I think also just having those policies, uh, your handbooks really updated because that's really what anyone can hold you to is okay. your handbook, your policy. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And then uh, I think similarly, someone's asking, can you mandate teachers to be on camera? Um, again, it's gonna have to be a school policy and, you know. Yeah, I would say you would have more of a, of a reason to mandate it for the teachers. And I imagine that, that you can mandate it for the teachers, but for the same reason, I would say, you wanna understand if a teacher doesn't wanna be on camera, why? And, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, again, you, you, I understand some, uh, some teachers saying, I don't want family members to just kind of be able to, to see that in the classroom, only my student sees me. But um, again, you can then design a policy that ensures that 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 camera is on the student and uh, um, and it is in a way that is similar and mimics the classroom. And I would say in that case, you certainly would be able to mandate that the teacher's face be be shown. And I think that's where, as as uh, private schools, we have a lot of leeways. We can set our own policies and absolutely have a policy for uh, the recording of classes or posting of the sessions and 
so on and so forth. Yes. Uh, Brother Safa, with this question about um, parents recording and posting on social media or sharing, can can we say that uh, that our live sessions are our personal property and they can't do anything with them? Is that a is that a route that we could take? I, I mean, without a without a consent form that says I understand that this is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you would need a consent form, actually, probably. Uh, you would have some right. I don't know if it can be trumped by the school or not. You will have some right, but I don't think it's not that, that simple where you can say, this is my property, you can't use it. It's not as simple as that. You would have some right. You would have to show some grounds. Uh, yeah. So could, could we, because this, this became a big issue in, in the spring about, um, because we, for, for example, our school started with recording all our Zoom classes and we were hoping to be able to share them with students who missed class or for whatever reason, but then became concerned about what happens with the pictures of those students online, what, do, what are parents going to do with them. Can we then, but can, and if we just put it as part of our policy that to protect other students' rights, that we do, we do not can give consent to parents to share this. I mean, would that would that carry any weight? I mean, it it would it would. But again, how much can you can you uh, ensure compliance? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, sometimes the the threat of it or the sure. the, the and, uh, and also it's, even, it's, yeah yeah. Those, those are good questions. I, I mean, uh, I, I saw a comment uh, from Sister Moazen um, regarding the fact that some schools already have cameras uh, in the classroom recording video and audio. And I would say in general, uh, the rule there is, is the idea is that just like when you walk into a department store or you are in a parking lot and they say camera is at work, whatever. The, in general, the law is that you cannot do it in secret. It has to mm -hmm. be it has to be, but if, 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 if I, but, but there, by the way, you are an invitee. So if you walk into Walmart, they didn't force you to be there. You chose to be there. And they disclosed to you that there's a camera. And that's all the law that asked that you, you went there on your own volition. And they told you that they are recording. And, and that's all they would have to show. Uh, in a school situation, in a classroom situation, um, you know, it, it would be interesting for, I mean, it would require a little bit more of a study, although I agree that already it is, it is settled law in, 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 um, in that you can have cameras in the classroom as long as it is, it is known, announced, et cetera. Uh, but I would say even then, by the way, the use of it is something that scares me, you know, um, you know and, and I would definitely advise that that, that things should erase regularly, uh, probably. Um, but that's an area that that again needs to be to be looked at and, and uh, you know, and 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 discuss with with the local council. Thank you. Dr. Abdul Majid has a good point. Go ahead and share it, and we can wrap up after that, inshallah. <laughs> yes. So oh, he's just saying that FERPA should update their student rights policies. And I'm um, almost sure it, it, it will happen very shortly. I'm almost sure that it will happen. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. Um, I mean, I'm, by the way, I mean, that's to the question to the security cameras. That's an issue that I'm going to research further, actually, um, because it, it's an interesting issue um, that, that now more than ever is going gonna, is, is gonna to come. You know, that's another thing that, that people don't realize. Just because something has been practiced and done, um, the fact that it's never been legally challenged um, doesn't mean that it's okay, doesn't mean that it's legal, doesn't mean... You know, and there are some things that may have been practiced by schools and nobody ever challenged them. Nobody ever, you know, thought about <coughs> how they may become an issue. Um, um, so, so just be weary as a school leader uh, of the uh, faulty assumption that because we've always done this, 
or because many schools do this and it never been a problem, that doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot be a problem in the future or doesn't also mean that it is okay or legally okay. It's just that nobody have challenged it or it never have come to the forefront. And you know, our system of laws is, is one that doesn't try to go and anticipate, uh, rather it waits until somebody raises a legal issue. Somebody says, you have no right as a school to do this, or you have, you know, you violated this right or right, that right of mine and go to court with it. Only then it becomes of concern to the, to the, to the court. Otherwise it can be illegal and being done and being done by a lot of people and nobody brought it to, to a forefront. So, so that, that's one issue I'm gonna look at closer, inshallah. Sister Sufia, do you have uh, any more questions that came up in the chat? If, if there's anyone who has any questions, um, this is the opportunity to voice them. We're coming on around four o'clock right now. Um, Jazakallah khair, Brother Safa, um, Sister Tabassum for putting this together, Sister Sufia, Sister Sue, and everyone who made this webinar possible. We'll close out now with Brother Safa with a closing dot, please. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for uh, participating. May Allah reward you. Uh, you know, the, the work that, that, that educators, Muslim educators and educators of Islamic schools uh, do is one that's uh, uh, underappreciated. And, and, and if I have to, to single out uh, one single class of unsung heroes, it, it is really our educators, our, um, our board members of Islamic schools, uh, they make it happen. Um, and so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to reward each and every one of you uh, for everything that you do. Uh, and, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us always uh, to do the right thing and do what is pleasing to him and for his sake and his sake alone. Jazakum Allah khair. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.